To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, visit gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. Say you have a pile of Lego in front of you. Each neon brick might not seem like much by itself, but once you start combining them, you can create some pretty elaborate structures, like this Lego version of Frankenstein's monster. At the lowest level of complexity, there are a bunch of little plastic pieces attached to each other. On a component level, we've got a pair of legs, a torso, a pair of arms, and a head. And at the most complex level, it's, well, what you see here. A whole monster! Ah! Any Lego sculpture, from a kit to a custom build, requires a human to see the potential in a disorganized pile of building blocks, and to combine them into something bigger, and potentially more monstrous. In object-oriented programming, we do something similar by combining simpler data structures and objects to create sophisticated programs. But instead of the horrible pain of stepping on a Lego, you get to feel the emotional pain of debugging for three hours straight. Yay! While there's always more that we can add to our Java toolkit, the key to building more intricate object-oriented programs is to imagine the world around us complexly. That's where the magic happens. Hi, I'm Sabrina Cruz, he is Frankenstein's monster, and this is Study Hall, code and programming for beginners. We can use everything we've learned about object-oriented programming to build some monsters of our own. In code, because we don't have any corpses lying around. Right? Right? Wanna stop asking questions? Anyway, according to every single video game ever, once you build monsters, you've gotta make them fight. I don't make the rules. So let's start by thinking through these smaller, concrete components of a monster fight. We need weapons, participants, rules, microtransactions. Oh, and a way to win. We can represent these concepts in code by using Java's value types as our building blocks and classes as our slightly more complex components. Remember, value types are simpler Java objects like numbers, booleans, and chars. So let's start simple and create a weapon class, since every monster worth their salt needs something to fight with. Then we'll tackle the actual monsters. And finally, the battle will begin. There is a lot of code in this episode, so we'll go into slightly less detail than previous videos to fit it all in. Feel free to pause this video if you want to take a closer look at any specific code block. Okay, for the weapon class, we really just need two attributes, a string for the weapon's name and an integer for the maximum damage it can inflict. We're essentially constructing a weapon from these two building blocks, the string and the int. And then we add a constructor and some getter methods, and that's it, we're done. The monster class is a little more complicated because each monster will have a name like Flesh Eater Fangbot or Jolene some quantity of health, and a weapon. Again, we're constructing a more complex object from simpler building blocks. So in a way, we're doing a little bit of Frankensteining of our own. After we add the constructor and getter methods, we can use a couple of instance methods to build the logic that monsters will use to take damage and deliver their weapon's maximum damage. And now it's time for the more complicated battle class, which will use both our monster and weapon classes as components. So let's get ready to rumble! To have our our battle, we first need to build our weapons, a sword and an axe. And we need to create two monsters, the fiery flesh eater Fangbot and the icy Jolene. Next, we'll initialize some variables that we'll use to keep track of random numbers and battle rounds. For now, let's use a while loop to control the fight, which continues as long as both monsters have some health left. In each round of the fight, we randomly select an attacker and a defender. The defender takes damage from the attacker, and we document what happens that round. If either monster's health reaches zero, the battle ends and we break the while loop. Otherwise, the defender launches a counterattack, and we check again to see whether or not both monsters have enough health to keep fighting. Then we increment the fight round variable and rerun the loop. Since we can only exit the while loop once a monster's health reaches zero, the other monster, who does have some health left, will emerge victorious. Victorious. Rip in peace, Jolene. And that is it for our monster battle. If we take a closer look at these class definitions, you'll notice that all of the attributes we declared are private. Basically, that means any data stored in an instance variable has restricted access, unlike public code, which would have open access. But as we saw in that battle, one monster can still modify the private health attribute of another monster to deal some damage. To fully understand how all the data in our code is organized and how different objects can interact, we need to dive deeper into what private actually means here. In Java, we can designate two 
basic levels of access to class properties, direct and indirect access. Direct access involves reassigning an instance variable with the dot operator. Meanwhile, indirect access involves changing the value of a variable using getter and setter methods. Using getters and setters is a best practice because it lets us implement security measures to make sure no one's messing with our variables by using the wrong data type, for example. In other words, we don't want gamers assigning monster.getHealth to any old value. We want to follow the principles of object-oriented programming. In general, an object can always access its own variables directly. Plus, every object in a given class can also access the private variables of other objects in that class. So in our monster battle program, when we instantiate a monster object, we directly set the instance variables using the constructor method. But when one monster attacks another, the attacker indirectly accesses the defender's health attribute with getters and setters. In fact, it's kind of a double indirect access because they have to go through the attack method and the take damage method. Again, this only works because both of the fighters are instantiated objects of the monster class. A monster can't change the private variables of a weapon and vice versa, because objects that belong to different classes can't access each other's private attributes. But Sabrina, you might be thinking, when we called this.weapon.getMaxDamage, our monsters were able to use their weapons, and monsters and weapons are two different classes. Well, that's because the get Better method, get max damage, has a workaround. It's defined as public, which means that other classes can access it, even though the underlying max damage variable is private to the weapon class. Sometimes you have to hack your own code. Just a little. So, getting and setting values can be really helpful, but sometimes it takes away from the user experience. If you're developing a game, you don't want to have to go in and set the health level of every single monster. That would get super tedious if you need to generate, like, an army of 100 gelatinous cubes. Instead, we want multiple ways to create our monster objects, one that includes the health as a parameter that we input, and one that sets the health for us. And to have this flexibility, we need multiple constructors. We already built a regular constructor for the monster class that takes three parameters, and we need all three to create each new monster object. Let's call this constructor the three param constructor, or 3PC for short. Java has a special mechanism we can use to create another constructor that connects to the 3PC. Through this mechanism, called constructor chaining, we can build another constructor to automatically initialize a monster object's starting health. Specifically, we can code a 2PC, or 2Param constructor, with a few minor changes to the parameters. The 2PC will rely on the 3PC, which is responsible for instantiating a new class object. So in programmer jargon, we say that the 2PC invokes the 3PC. Any class with at least two constructors can use constructor chaining. And technically, we can chain as many constructors as we want in any order, depending on the amount of parameters involved. To chain constructors in our program, we need our old friend, the this keyword. In a couple of previous episodes, we used the this keyword to reference the class instance object or to access instance attributes and methods. Here, we'll use the this keyword as a call to a specific constructor within a class that creates the monster object exactly how we want. Think of the this keyword as a messenger that sends any user supplied arguments from the chain 2 PC back to the 3 PC. So we have some parameters that come from the user and some some that are pre-programmed as part of the 2PC. Like usual, the best way to fully understand a new concept in Java is by trying it out. So let's create a chained monster class to test out constructor chaining. We have two constructor methods, both declared using public chained monster. This syntax should look familiar because it's also what we use to declare unchained constructor methods. The first constructor method is our 3PC because it takes all three arguments that define each chained monster object, name, health level, and weapon. In this constructor, we directly set all of the parameters as usual. But sometimes we want to instantiate a chained monster object and have our program automatically set the starting health level for us. That's what our second constructor method is for, the 2PC. In this constructor, we'll only take parameters for name and weapon, and then autofill a health parameter of 100. We use the this keyword to invoke the 3PC and pass on all of these parameters. Now we have two different 
different options for a user who's creating a new chain monster. If they supply three arguments, we'll use the three PC with a custom health amount. If they only supply two, we'll jump to the chain constructor, the two PC, and the health level will be set for us at 100. By accounting for multiple scenarios and using techniques like constructor chaining, we can solve more complex problems with computer science. And complex problems are usually way too tangled to solve all at once. So every programmer's goal is to find these simple problems within the complex one, to see what it would take to turn a pile of Lego into a Frankenstein's monster, if you will. That's why in real world situations, the hard part of programming isn't the coding. The hard part is identifying which mini problems to solve in the correct order with the right people so you can eventually tackle the overall task. And oh my gosh, that is what product managers are paid for. So practicing good habits at this stage of your programming journey, both in theory and when you dig into code, is super important because your future self well, thank you. If you're enjoying Study Hall Code and Programming for Beginners and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. Thanks for watching and see you next time.